Good evening, everyone. We have three audiences here tonight. So we have our in-person audience, we have our Zoom audience, and we also have our YouTube audience. So we wanna make sure that uh, we allow for our in-person audience to continue to come into the room as we begin our intros. Uh, but I wanna welcome everyone to Penn West Edinburgh and to the beautiful Dr. William P. Alexander Music Center. My name is Amanda Brown Sissom, and I am the Edinburgh Campus Administrator and the Associate Vice President for Alumni Engagement for Penn West. And as such, it is my privilege to welcome you on behalf of our interim president, Dr. Lori Bernatsky, and the Penn West leadership team to tonight's Dr. James F. Pardon me, Dr. James F. Drain Religion and Culture Speaker Series. I want to welcome first and thank our 2023 lecturer, Dr. Yalen, Director of the and Associate Professor at the Center of Global Health Ethics at Duquesne University. Uh, we have with us tonight our retired faculty member, Dr. Boy Shin, who remains a key champion in stewarding this event. Um, thank you to Dr. James Fisher, our Associate Provost, Dr. Mary Panacea Carden, who is our Edinburgh Campus Dean and our Dean of the College of Education, Arts and Humanities for Penn West, and Dr. Pia Aramesh, our Director of the Bioethics Institute and our Penn West faculty member. Without this team of dedicated professionals, these series would just not happen. We are pleased to share this event, as I said, both with our in-person audience, our student, students, faculty, staff, and community members here in Edinburgh, and via Zoom for our online students and sister campuses and those watching through Penn West YouTube's page. We will be recording this lecture and it will remain on that YouTube page for future use. Before we begin, I'd like to share a few housekeeping items with you. Um, first of all, the lecture this evening will last approximately an hour, leaving time at the end for questions. You received a note card if you're in person with us and a pen on your way in. We ask that you write your questions down and then we'll collect them um, because we're also going to have questions posted to the chat in Zoom and to the comment section on our YouTube page. If you require assistance during tonight's, assistance during tonight's lecture, I'll remain in the back of the room um, and your restrooms are out uh, the door through the lobby and to the left. And um, again, we wanna welcome you here on this very busy week on our campus. This is an exciting time and a very important topic. I'd like to now introduce Dr. Roy Shin to say a few words about the series and its founder, Dr. Jean Strain. Thank you and welcome to uh, everybody here in the room as well as So um, for those of you who don't know, um, Dr. Drain passed away uh, earlier this year in April um, at 93 years old. Um, and it's ironic that uh, you know that we're dealing with this topic end of life care uh, because he was experiencing that himself this year. We had actually invited speaker and the topic um, before he entered into that condition. So uh, I guess it was meant to be. Um, tonight, I'd like to reflect uh, on the legacy of Dr. Dream by highlighting four areas of contributions. Uh, as a scholar, as a teacher slash mentor slash student advisor, uh, as a friend slash counselor slash humanitarian, and finally, as a university community citizen. Uh, for some of you, this will ring, I'll ring a bell, who knew uh, Jim well. And for those who don't, um, I'm hoping that that will give you a little bit better idea about him. So we'll start with Scholar, and he authored 20 different books uh, in the area of ethics, including Religion and Ethics in 1976, Making Life and Death Decisions for Others in 1991, Clinical Bioethics in 1994, Becoming a Good Doctor, Place of Virtue and Character in Medical Ethics in 1995, Caring to the End, <coughs> Suggestions and Ethics Education for Hospice and Home Health Agencies in 1997, More Humane Medicine in 2003, and at the ripe age of 89, he published his last book called Medicine, Ethics, and Religion. Um, so he was very prolific and well-known throughout the world. He was also a visiting professor at the University of Madrid, 
the University of Tennessee Medical School, uh, and the manager of the School of Psychiatry actually worked with uh, Dr. Manager. Um, he co-founded the discipline of bioethics in 2002. Second area, teacher, mentor, student advisor. He was a professor here from 1969 to 1993, taught courses in philosophy, religion, ethics, and bioethics, death and dying. He discovered Edinburgh because of a snowstorm that canceled his flight. It's, it's an interesting story, how he got here. And some people refer to that as an accident, and others call that God's grace. He educated hundreds of students pursuing health professions on how and why they needed to follow professional, professional ethics standards, including helping me when I returned here and was teaching a course in professional life for graduate students in speech language pathology. Um, he really helped give me a lot more insight into um, not only the importance, but the why. Why we do that? Why, why it's so important? He helped guide students of every major there is to finding their calling. I mean, he was just like, he was a master teacher and a master advisor, built into one. Um, he continued to work daily at the Bioethics Institute uh, until age 90, oftentimes walking here from his home a mile away uh, and back. Uh, spent the day. Um, as a friend, counselor, and humanitarian, the third category, he was a sincere listener to all points of view, a model of civil discourse on any topic. And it didn't matter how controversial it was, he could talk to you without the blood pressure and without the voices clear. Offered words of encouragement to anyone who appeared to be discouraged or anxious. He was just a very kind person. Enjoyed conversations with friends and colleagues at lunch in the cafeteria almost daily. And I see a, a few of his old buddies here at home today. Um, he offered in person support and guidance to many that he knew were facing life struggles or dying. He visited an awful lot of people who were in the last throes of their life. Um, and the last category is university and community citizen. He attended countless university cultural and athletic events and supported participants. If he knew somebody that was doing that event, he found a way to get there. I mean, it was really important that he was just at so many things. He brought many international and respected speakers to campus. It was very impressive from Little Edinburgh University uh, to have the kind of speakers that he brought here through his network. Uh, locally, he taught religious education classes at Our Lady of the Lake Church. Um, he established the Endowed Bioethics Institute, where he was the Russell Roth Professor of Ethics, Bioethics. Um, he helped the university find an outstanding successor to direct the Bioethics Institute just a few years ago, Dr. Aramish, who we'll hear from in just a moment, through, all through his networking. Uh, in 2019, he created this endowed speaker series on religion and culture as a way to educate students and the community about the many positive contributions of religious of religion and religious figures. Um, I'll just conclude by saying, when you have time, um, and some of you have, may have seen this, but I, uh, just Google up on YouTube a music video called "Humble and Kind" by Tim McGraw. In memory of the legacies of uh, Dr. Drain. I would like to now pass the microphone to Dr. Aranesh, who will introduce this evening's speaker. Thank you, Dr. Shin. It's an honor for me to introduce uh, tonight's speaker, Dr. Rose Hedan, uh, the an associate professor and director of the uh, Center for Global Bioethics at Duke University. Uh, Dr. Hedan uh, got 
a master's uh, degree uh, in history from University of Lumen, another master's degree in religious studies from University of Lumen, a master's degree in theology from University of Lumen, a master's degree in Indian philosophy and religion from Banaras Hindu University in India, and a PhD in theology from University of Leuven, Belgium in 2010. He, uh, his uh, doc doctoral dissertation was on palliative care physicians and nurses, ethical attitudes and religious beliefs at the end of life in Flanders, Belgium, and New Delhi, India. Uh, from 2010 until 2014, he worked at the University of Leuven as a postdoctoral scholar uh, with a postdoctoral fellowship uh, of the Research Foundation at Flanders. In, and since August 2014, he has been a faculty member at the Center of and now it's Center for Global Bioethics. At that time, it was a Center for Healthcare Ethics. And uh, so he has published uh, extensively many books and, uh, and, and uh, papers, uh, mostly uh, about the topic of palliative care from a global perspective. In 2014, I was a PhD student at Duke University at the Center for Healthcare Ethics, where I met a young faculty who had very interesting and extensive knowledge about different cultures from East and West, and also the, the relation to uh, biomedical ethics and one of the most complicated and challenging issues in biomedical ethics, that's palliative ethics and end of life care. I took uh, his classes and really enjoyed them. Uh, and uh, later he invited me to be to join the authors of his edited book, uh, Religion and Spirituality in, in End of Life Care. And part of the pro project was a visit to Leuven University, participating in a seminar in Leuven University. So I got the chance to visit his beautiful city and country. Our, our friendship continued and uh, now we are planning uh, to hold uh, the Duquesne Penwest Conference on uh, Global Bioethics. Uh, its inaugural uh, session will be held uh, in 2024 and we are hoping that it will be a biannual uh, conference new updates will be coming soon. So today, I, uh, I, uh, I, now I invite you to join me in, uh, in uh, applauding Dr. Uh, Dr. Filian and inviting him to the podium. Thank you. All right. Uh, Thanks, Pia, for this uh, introduction. And now it's a fact. Now we cannot go back anymore with this uh, conference because now it's been officially announced. So yeah. <laughs> we'll have to go through it. Um, it's really an honor to be here tonight. Um, it's uh, uh, an honor to speak in the lecture series called After Dr. Gray. And of course, in bioethics, there are many big guys, people with uh, with great ideas. Um, but Dr. Greg somehow stand out because he is one of these people who has developed ideas and concepts that are used by clinical ethicists in their everyday practice. And sometimes these people will not really even know that this was Dr. Drain who actually uh, piloted these ideas, uh, but he has really been a very influential player. Uh, and uh, many of these ideas uh, will, of course, go on being used. So yeah, really, it's really an honor to be here. Um, I'm going to talk today about religion and spirituality and end of life care. Um, Dr. Armes already said that a lot of my work has been more particular uh, in, uh, in palliative care, but you will also see how many things that I'm going to uh, 
talk about how they're actually not restricted to ballot care, but how they're also more broadly relevant to the broader field of, uh, of end of life care. I'm going to talk about religion and spirituality from the perspective of everyone who is involved in uh, palliative care and end of life care, because very often it is said that religion is important for patients and um, sometimes also for their relatives. But it's not just for patients and relatives, it's also for people who are working in, uh, in palliative care. Now, the role that religion and spirituality play in palliative care is very diverse. And indeed, it can sometimes be a little bit confusing because the influence of religion can be by so many directions. Sometimes religion can, can indeed be a source of support for people who want to work in palliative care or even for patients who are going through, through suffering and pain. But sometimes religion and spirituality can also be a source of distress when prayers and calls to God are not being answered. So these are the kind of things that, uh, that we're going to talk about in, 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 this, uh, in this lecture. I'm also not going to restrict my, uh, my talk to uh, this beautiful Pennsylvania context. I'm going to take you a little bit, uh, you could say, on a tour of the world, because I'm going to talk about uh, some of the research projects that I have been uh, involved in myself, and that actually have given me the opportunity to walk to work with people from very different backgrounds. Um, I've worked, of course, with people from Christian backgrounds, but I've also worked with people in, in, in India who are who have a Muslim or a, or a Hindu background. So I'm going to talk about that, and we're going to use these studies, these observations, as a starting point to reflect upon what religion and spirituality actually means to people at the end of life. Um, and to start, I'm going to start my story actually in Belgium. Uh, Dr. Anamish already spoke about the um, city of uh, Leuven. Uh, it's, a small, it's a small town in Belgium near, near Brussels. Uh, 20 minutes from Brussels, actually. Uh, it's actually a small town, uh, but it has a huge university. And during the academic year, there are actually more students in the town than, uh, than full time inhabitants. Um, but this, and the nice thing about towns in Europe, that's one of the things that I like, is that um, although sometimes the towns may not be big, you always find traces of history. And people walk along these streets, and very often they're not, not even aware of the importance of these small traces of history. And this is one of these traces of history. This is actually, it's called the Roman gate. And you immediately see why it's called the Roman gate, because it's in fact well, a gate in the Roman, Roman style. It's not built by the Romans, it's the Scandic style that, that um, um, dominated in, in which buildings were built in Europe in the uh, Middle Ages. And this gate actually, uh, so that's, that's in fact all that, that remains of that ancient um, Roman building. It's, it's just the gate, there, there are other buildings built around it, but this gate is the only original part of it. Um, and this gate used to be the entrance to what is called, what, what used to be called the hospice. And the hospice was a place where religious sisters cared for um, the ill and the dying, but also for pilgrims who are traveling to the big pilgrimage sites in Europe, such as Santiago de Compostela and in Rome. So people used to pass through Leuven uh, as pilgrims or just people in need of care, and then they used to go here to the hospice. And of course, from the word hospice later, they developed the word uh, hospital. So this was a place where religious sisters cared for these um, for this, uh, ill people. And this also became the site of the first hospital in, uh, in Leuven. And this was also the site where later on was the university hospital was being built. And in the end, it also used to be the site where I was born. Um, so it's a very important place. Uh, now the hospital is no longer there because the hospital gradually moved out to a more sprawling campus outside the, outside the town. But this, this part is still there. Now, I'm telling you this story because it illustrates the importance that, in fact, religion always has had in, in healthcare, not just for patients, but also for people who are working in healthcare. Um, religion has been a driving force. Religion has been something that motivates people to dedicate themselves to, um, to the care of the sick and the, and the dying. And we still see that. Um, in many branches of, uh, of healthcare. Of course, 
because healthcare has become uh, second. Uh, but we still see that the that relation is, uh, is important. And that we also see, for instance, in, uh, in palliative care. And I'm, I'm sure um, most of you are familiar with the term uh, palliative care and uh, also the, the related concept uh, hospice care. Um, but for those who are less familiar, I've given here the, uh, the famous definition of palliative care of the WHO, World Health Organization. And it's an interesting definition because this definition immediately illustrates the importance that religion, or you could say more broadly, spirituality, still has in, um, in healthcare and more in particular in palliative care, and you could also say in, uh, in end of life care. So the definition is as follows. Palliative care is an approach that improves the quality of life of patients and their families facing the problem associated with life-threatening illness through the prevention and relief of suffering by means of early identification and impeccable assessment and treatment of pain and other problems, physical, psychosocial, and that is the important, that's what trust is important, and spiritual. So palliative care is a holistic approach. Because people who work in palliative care, they are aware that at the end of life, it's well, and not just at the end of life, in fact, whenever, whenever you're confronted with suffering, with Illness. It's not just about um, about the pain and the symptoms. It's also like people also ask themselves all kind of questions. Why is this happening to me? Why am I getting ill? Of course, they may know the biology, but that's not the kind of answer that they're searching for. They want to know why is this happening to me? Um, why am I not getting better? Um, who is there to support me? Is there some kind of power? That is so people ask themselves all this all this kind of now, sometimes these questions can really become very troubling. For instance, if a patient, if a patient has been very religious throughout his life and has been praying to God and is going to church and religious services, and then suddenly a person falls ill, the person may start wondering, where is God now? I feel so alone. I feel, I feel lonely in my suffering. My family is there, but they don't really understand me. I want to get cured. Why is God not curing me? So that can be a real source of distress. And in palliative care, people, the healthcare professionals, should be aware that people ask themselves this kind of questions. And these are questions that need to be addressed as well, as well along with all the other symptoms that uh, the patients have. So it's not just about uh, physical pain, uh, it's also about psych psychological pain, social connections, and then the real religious and spiritual issues that are related to now, one person who very thoroughly realized uh, the importance of uh, religion at, uh, at the end of life was, uh, was this lady. This is Dame uh, Cicely Saunders. And she is seen as one of the founders of what is now called the modern hospice movement. And the hospice movement is a kind of predecessor of what is now called uh, palliative care. And she, really had understood that at the end of life, suffering that people go through can be, um, can be tremendous and need, needs to be addressed. And when she started working as a nurse in the 1950s in England, she very quickly realized that people were not paying enough attention to the pain and suffering that all these patients go through at the end of life. So she started asking herself that question, what can we do for all these, uh, for all these patients? And the, uh, she came up with a double X. First thing was, of course, we need good pain and symptom management. We need to manage their pain. So she started to search for ways to improve the pain. And one of the uh, solutions that she and her colleagues came up with was um, management through, uh, through, through morphine. That was one important thing. But she also realized that that alone is not enough. We need to pay attention to the other components of pain because pain is a total experience. And that's how she, how she put the term total pain. Because if you're really in suffering, this is not just like my leg hurts or my toe hurts. It's about this pain is dominating my life and I can no longer go. So in that sense, that pain becomes very existential because it really starts dominating. People start asking themselves, also, start reflecting on the pain. So they try to find meaning in their uh, pain. Now, what Cicely Saunders also wondered was if religion is so, and spirituality is so important for patients, then maybe it should also be important for the healthcare professionals who care for them. 
And initially, she actually wondered whether people who want to dedicate their works, their work in their life uh, to the new movement of palliative care, she wondered whether these people should not be actually um, religious people. So she even wondered, should these people actually not be part of a religious congregation, much like these sisters who cared for the ill and the dying pilgrims in the Middle Ages. So she started thinking from that older uh, perspective. And this is uh, what she once wrote in a letter to one of the people with whom she discussed uh, her ideas. So she said, uh, in this work, and then she referred to her work in uh, palliative care, the medical and spiritual are inextricably mingled. I long to bring patients to know the Lord and to do something towards helping many of them to hear of him before they die. But I also long to raise standards of terminal care throughout the country. So here in this quote, you see these two components that I have been talking about. So um, she longs to raise the standards of terminal care throughout the country. So there she is talking about that management of physical pain and the other symptoms. But she also said these patients need, need something more. She wants them to hear, to, to know the Lord. So she wants to give them hope. She wants to give them some taste of the religion that she finds important uh, to herself. Um, these were uh, her visions back in the, uh, this letter was written in 1960. Now, you see that she was really driven by, uh, by a religious zeal, you would say, to proclaim, uh, to proclaim her faith. Palliative care, of course, is more common. And um, now there are not that many people, of course, there still are people, but there are not that many people who would still say that they work um, in palliative care because they want uh, patients to know the Lord. They will at least not directly start talking about their, their own religious, uh, religious beliefs. So palliative care and, and life care more generally has become, uh, has become secular. And we also see that in the kind of care that is being uh, that is being proved. So it's more secular. Secular. It's focused on techniques. Techniques. It's focused on uh, skills. And what we see is that gradually that spiritual and religious motivation that really drove Cecily Saunders and the other early founders of the modern hospice movement that has uh, receded a little bit uh, to the background. And in that sense, of course, palliative care has followed. You would say. Um, slide the sides um, because indeed um, Western Europe and substantial part of the Western world has become much more secular. So um, religion has um, receded to the background as you could say as a public motivator of what uh, what people uh, say they do. That doesn't mean of course that religion is not no more not not important anymore. And that's what we're going to do. Now, we are going to talk about life care, or we could say palliative care, as a, as a global movement, because palliative care has also spread. Palliative care has not remained restricted to that, that 1960s Christian environment in which Cicely Saunders uh, developed her uh, ideas. This map here presents uh, data from uh, 2017, and it uh, depicts the uh, spread of, uh, of palliative care globally. So the um, the details of the coloring um, are not very important, um, but what you must look at is this uh, is this gray color here because that shows where there is no known palliative care activity. All the other countries, all the countries that are not in gray, have some level of palliative care. Um, programs. So what that concretely means, basically, when you look at the map, you see the fact that there is very little gray. So palliative care really has spread all over the world. So what does that mean very concretely? Well, that means that palliative care has spread to, um, to countries, to concepts that are not specifically Christian. So that, are, that have an entirely different uh, religious and cultural setup. So we can ask ourselves, well, palliative care originated within that uh, Christian environment. How is palliative care going to adapt to these different religious and cultural environments? And how, what kind of role is religion going to play there? Is it also going to be important to patients? And if it's going to be important, 
How is it going to be? Is it going to be important to healthcare professionals? Is it going to motivate them? Is it going to inform their decisions? Or is it going to inform what they find right and wrong in, um, in healthcare? These are all questions that this new situation actually triggers. Um, and this here is, uh, is the entrance of the, uh, well, the name is there, the Dr. Ambedkar Institute for Rotary Cancer Hospital uh, in New Delhi. It is um, part of the old India Institute of uh, Medical Science, and that is a tertiary hospital in, uh, in Delhi. So it's one of the um, foremost uh, research institutions in, in healthcare in India. And this is also the place where, uh, where I worked for two, of, uh, two years. Um, I've worked there, and I'm still to this day collaborating with uh, researchers from that institutions on different projects related to ethics, uh, religion, and spirituality at the end of life. So we're um, having all these uh, projects. So I'm going to talk, talk to you about um, religion and spirituality in this um, in this context. So just um, to give you a little bit of uh, background, so that you can situate a little bit the stories uh, about patients and physicians and nurses that are a little bit about bit, bit about background on uh, palliative care in India. So palliative care in India was uh, introduced in the second half of the 1980s. So that is like um, approximately 20 years after um, Cicely Saunders really uh, developed her ideas about uh, palliative care. So throughout India, we have um, palliative care programs, um, but the problem with palliative care uh, programs in India is that the coverage is limited. So there are great palliative care programs, there is a diversity of palliative care programs in India, but the problem is that they are restricted, mainly restricted to, um, to the big cities. It's a little bit different uh, in southern India where um, palliative care is a little bit better integrated in, uh, into healthcare, but overall in India you could say if you're not living in a big city and you need palliative care, then I'm sorry, you're out of luck. Then you're only um, the only opportunity or the only way for you to get access to palliative care is to travel all the way to the big city. Then you can you can imagine um, if you are uh, suffering from a terminal illness, if you're in pain, traveling long distances and public public transport, it's not it's not a job, of course. But there, there there are many people who do that because that's the only way for them to get access to these to the drugs that they need and to get access to the treatment that they need. Um, in India also, um, generally the focus of palliative care is on, uh, on cancer patients. Uh, palliative care, well, of course, symptoms in at the end of life, cancer patients can be very severe. So it's normal for palliative care to pay a lot of attention to that. But palliative care as such is not restricted to, uh, to cancer care. Um, palliative care is also about well, suffering for anyone suffering from uh, a life limiting or life threatening uh, condition, anyone who is uh, as having severe pain and symptoms. And what we see in India is that generally the focus is still on cancer patients, but there are effort now gradually to to reach out to other uh, areas of healthcare. So in order not to keep it uh, restricted to to cancer. Um, I already told you that there was a huge diversity of palliative care programs, just like here in the United States. So uh, you have home care teams who um, go and visit people within their uh, region. You also have programs that are rely, rely on trained volunteers and then refer the patients to the professionals when the patient needs more advanced care. There are also uh, auspices, and then auspices in India means really uh, places where people go to die in the last weeks or days of their lives. There are also great pain clinics for people that are outpatient units where people uh, receive uh, pain and symptom management. Uh, and there are also palliative care units, and these are hospital units where people are hospitalized until uh, their pain and symptoms are sufficiently under control, and then they can go home where they can receive um, care through the home care team, provided they live within the service area of the home care team, which is not a problem. Um, Palliative care in India is tends not to be uh, not to be very expensive in the sense that these palliative care programs try to keep uh, palliative care accessible. So they rely on charity funding. They rely on government services. Um, what we have seen in the last ten years is that gradually there is also broader interest. 
from corporate hospitals to get involved in palliative care. Earlier, corporate hospitals in India were not interested in palliative care. They were interested in providing curated treatment because they could make a lot of more money with that, of course. But care uh, does not bring in uh, a lot of money. Although gradually, these corporate hospitals also have started developing that awareness that um, if their patients die in pain while undergoing a um, futile treatment, focused on cure, that's not good advertisement. So gradually, they have uh, understood the need of also providing uh, palliative care to their patients. So gradually, um, palliative care is also being offered in these uh, corporate hospitals. Um, what I would like to talk to you about is how religion in this setting of palliative care and end of life care, how that actually still informs the um, attitudes of, uh, of healthcare professionals. And this is also going to help us understand the uh, various ways in which religion influences attitudes, uh, sorry, in which religion still plays a role in, uh, in end of life care and palliative care. So when we're talking about uh, end of life care, when people are reaching the end of life, there are um, a lot of difficult ethical decisions that need to be uh, made. Now we can um, group these ethical decisions into uh, three main groups of treatment. So the first main group of treatments is, is the group of uh, ongoing curative and or life, uh, life sustaining treatment. Um, so, at the end of life, um, patients sometimes reach a situation in which the curative treatment that they are working, that they, that they have been receiving, is no longer working. So it may be then time to decide to withdraw that treatment. For instance, they may be getting chemotherapy, and that chemotherapy may no longer be working. Um, or they may be really at the end of their lives, and they may still be getting artificial nutrition and hydration. If the patient is going to die within a few days, well, maybe that artificial nutrition and hydration is no longer helpful. It's no longer meaningful. So maybe it should be uh, without or uh, it's wrong. So these are the kind of things that we're talking about when we're talk talking about uh, foregoing curative or life sustaining treatments. So that's the first uh, group of treatments. And of course, you understand why these um, treatments can sometimes be, uh, be challenging uh, because. People may have a feeling that if you are withdrawing that treatment, then you may actually be killing the other patient. So there are people who are asking these questions. Then the second group of uh, treatments is uh, our treatments related to pain and symptom control. And when we talk about pain or symptom control at the end of life, it's important to be aware that these uh, symptoms at the end of life, that they can really be very uh, intense and that they really require very intensive pain and symptom management. And it also implies sometimes giving very high dosages of, um, of drugs, such as uh, morphine. And the problem with, uh, with this kind of drugs, of course, when you're giving them a very high, uh, very high dosages, they may actually have an impact on life expectancy. For instance, if you're going to increase morphine and you're going to increase it rapidly, then you may actually cause respiratory, respiratory depression as a consequence of patient like that. So there are also people who are asking this question, is that, uh, is that a problem? I'm just explaining the challenges very briefly without uh, going into detail. And then uh, the last group of treatment uh, decisions is about uh, euthanasia and assisted suicide. Um, these are um, legal in some regions, and uh, in some countries, but uh, they're not uh, legal in others. So when we're talking about uh, euthanasia and assisted suicide, when we're talking about euthanasia, we are talking about um, a patient who receives a lethal injection. That is how I will, uh, I will define uh, euthanasia. When we're talking about assisted suicide, we're talking about um, a patient who asks to die and gets a prescription for a lethal drug and then uh, takes that lethal drug in or herself. So that is uh, that is assisted suicide. So I'm going to use euthanasia suicide in this very narrow um, meanings because sometimes there are people who use euthanasia in a very broad meaning, and then it also includes uh, foregoing creative or life sustaining treatment. I'm not going to do that. 
because these treatment decisions are actually very different. So if you're going to use the term euthanasia for uh, lethal injection and for going of treatment, that's going to be very confused. In the end, you won't know what you're talking about. So I'm going to uh, restrict the term euthanasia to um, lethal, lethal drugs. And this is the um, issue that I would like to talk about to illustrate the um, influence of, uh, of religion on attitudes of nurses and physicians. So when we're talking about uh, euthanasia, I already summarized this, uh, this slide. So we have actually two main kinds of uh, euthanasia. You can have either voluntary euthanasia. A voluntary euthanasia is basically a patient who asks for, uh, for lethal injection or asks for uh, lethal drugs. So voluntary euthanasia is intentional administration of lethal drugs in order to painlessly terminate the life of a patient um, suffering from an incurable condition deemed unbearable by the patient at this patient's request. When it's non-voluntary, that's not a patient's request. So the patient has not requested it, but still we are around the UK. And assisted suicide, intentionally assisting a person at this person's request to terminate his um, sometimes it is said that problems related to euthanasia and assisted suicide are Western problems, but as this uh, newspaper cutting makes clear, it's a worldwide problem. So all over the world, people are asking that question. Is this, is this right? Um, we also have suffering patients who are actually saying, I no longer want to live. Please give me something. I want to die. So patients all over the world are asking these, uh, these questions. So it's not different uh, in any way. Um, when we're looking at um, attitudes towards um, assisted suicide in, uh, in euthanasia, studies have shown that there are various factors that are um, influencing these uh, attitudes. And we don't really need to um, review all of them, uh, but just to give an example, for instance, age. It's sometimes said that older physicians are more likely to approve or, um, oh, sorry, sorry, less likely to approve euthanasia than younger physicians. Or, for instance, generally, some studies have shown that um, women are less likely to approve of euthanasia than uh, male physicians. And the same is true for other healthcare professionals as well. Now, the um, studies have not been very consistent in their uh, findings of the influence of age, specialty, gender, country, or even patient characteristics. However, the studies have been very much more consistent about one factor, and that is, um, and that is religion. So religion seems to influence these, uh, these attitudes towards um, assisted suicide and uh, euthanasia. The question is, uh, how does it uh, influence these attitudes? And these are data from, uh, from a study that we did uh, back in Belgium. Now, Belgium is a little bit of a particular country because Belgium, just like the Netherlands, um, was one of the first countries to actually legalize euthanasia. So in Belgium, they have uh, euthanasia, just like in the, in the Netherlands. Since 2002, patients can actually legally get um, euthanasia. So we wanted to know what are the attitudes of people working in palliative care towards euthanasia and assisted suicide, and does religion still influence these, uh, these attitudes? And in order to study that, we send out a survey to all people working in, uh, in palliative care, and we ask them a lot of questions about euthanasia, assisted suicide, but we also ask them a lot of questions about their religion. And these questions about religion allowed us to um, divide the participants in five um, main groups. So we have the um, atheists or the agnostics, and these are people who are basically saying, well, um, either God doesn't exist or I don't care whether he exists or not. Uh, then we have the doubters. These are people who are saying like, well, maybe there is a God or maybe not. And then we have a group of kind of religious people, but these are different kinds of religious people. Um, in Belgium, we have, uh, you know, there in that group, we had actually church going people. So these were people who were going to church. We also had people who were religious, but did not go into church. And um, then we had what we call devout, devout church going people. So these were people who went to church very regularly, not necessarily every week, but very regularly. Um, most of the people in this uh, sample were, were Christians. So there were very few people belonging to other type of religion. So that is why you have that uh, church going term. So it's, there were most of them were Christians. 
Um, so what you see immediately here in this slide is that the uh, influence of ideology is very clear when you look at the uh, at this this uh, at this sort of diagnostic. So you see here that um, this is these are the atheists atheists and diagnostics. So you see most of them are still advocates. Then we have um, a smaller number of them who is moderate advocates, and then we also have smaller groups which are uh, moderate opponents. Um, I wrote here moderate opponents in between brackets because Belgium, as I said, we have euthanasia, and there are very few people who are actually fully against it. There are many people also in palliative care who say, um, I'm not in favor of it, and I would prefer that this was not legal in this country, but since it's legal, I understand that sometimes people want it, although I myself would not approve. So that is why we call them a moderate. So you see here, most of the people in the atheist agnostics group um, are actually staunch advocates and very few more moderate A very different picture do we get when we look at the church going uh, people. We see here, most of them are staunch advocates and um, the majority of them are either moderate uh, advocates or moderate opponents. So it's a very different picture. With the atheist diagnostics, we have most staunch advocates here, most of them for the, uh, for the church going uh, participants they are either in these two groups here. So they're either moderate advocates or moderate opponents. So more negative attitudes towards uh, Now, nevertheless, we see um, among these uh, religious groups, we do see, uh, see a difference. And we see that here in this, uh, in this moderate opponents group here. Um, we see here, for instance, that these two, you have these two groups of uh, church going people. You have the um, church going people and the devout church going people. You see that proportionally, um, they're much more likely to be moderate opponents than those who are religious but not uh, church going. So, what seems to be the conclusion here? Well, the conclusion seems to be straightforward. People who go to church seem to be uh, less likely to uh, approve of uh, euthanasia and assisted suicide. Now, we must be aware, of course, that uh, people in Belgium, I already alluded to that, most of them belonged, belonged at the time to the Roman Catholic Church or to another Christian uh, denomination. Only 6% of the people in that uh, survey belonged to a non-Christian religious or ideological community. And then um, we had the last uh, share, that's what we'll be, um, but um, these, these were the ones for having uh, no religion. So what this shows us is, well, this is indeed how religion may influence attitudes of um, healthcare professionals at the, who are working in this kind of life context in a Christian setting. But how does it actually work in, uh, in other settings? How does that, for instance, work? That's how. Um, how does that work, for instance, in a Hindu context, where you don't really have um, a church? People don't go there to church on Sundays. Well, Christians in India go to church on Sundays, but Hindus, they don't really have that uh, equivalent of a church. They go to, to the temple and they pray there, but it's not the same as going to church and listening to a sermon or something like that. So how does it work there? Well, when we uh, look at Hindu beliefs, one of these beliefs that um, often attracts attention is this belief in uh, in God. And that is the belief that every deed will have a consequence. So if I do good, I will receive good. Um, and if I do bad, well, then I will somehow receive bad. That's, that's the belief in God. Now, the belief in God is, is uh, as you may know, also associated with the belief in, uh, in rebirth. If um, I do bad, then I may experience the bad consequences of my deeds, but I may not necessarily experience these bad consequences in this life. I may also experience, experience them in, in the next life. So you never know really for sure when you are going to um, receive the consequences of your actions. So for people in the West, of course, rebirth it sounds always fun, like you have a nice life here, you will have a nice life next time. Um, but for Hindus, it's not so simple. Because for them, they also see the opportunities that this circle of uh, rebirths offer in the sense that you can always improve yourself because if you mess up this life, then maybe you may be able to do better next life. Um, but somehow they're also aware that each life has a lot of suffering. Um, even 
if you live a very good life, even if you're very healthy and you live a long, fulfilling life, even such a life as suffering in it. Because if you live long, then you will see people around you die. So there's also going to be a lot of suffering. Um, so ideally, of course, what you should do is you should find a way out of that cycle. That is cycle. And this is just uh, a newspaper cutting to show that people indeed uh, have these uh, beliefs. Because here you had one guy who said, well, um, he actually had been involved in an accident. That was his SUV. He had uh, run over while drunk. He had run over a few uh, people who were sleeping on the pavement and several of them had died. But what he actually said is, um, well, I'm not a bad guy, um, and in fact, this should not have happened to me, but I must have done something bad in a previous life. As a consequence of that, I'm getting the uh, sub, which means the imprisonment that he gets for uh, killing these people. Now, when you um, think about this point, um, and some philosophers have, that have thought about this, they have asked themselves the question, well, what does this, uh, this really mean, this belief in karma and this kind of belief in uh, rebirth? What does this really mean for uh, end-of-life care? And what does this mean, for instance, for attitudes to euthanasia and assisted suicide? Um, and some of these philosophers, um, but most of them are actually Western philosophers who use Hindu concepts to think about uh, end-of-life issues. Some of them have actually argued that in Hinduism, actually, euthanasia and assisted suicide, they may not be allowed because they result in bad karma for the physician. And their reasoning is, well, if you're going to give a lethal injection to a patient, then actually you're killing the patient, which is obviously something bad. Um, they say also that, um, that euthanasia is not only bad karma for the physician, but if you administer a lethal in injection to the patient, that patient can also no longer experience suffering. And they would say, well, actually, it's that suffering that is an opportunity to the patient to purify the bad current. So it's the, um, if we are euthanizing the patient, we're actually cutting short that uh, period of uh, purification that the patient may have. So they say for both the physician as well as the patient, euthanasia is bad. And some people, would actually say that this kind of views are an expression of Hindu values in the sense that you have to accept your fate, whatever befalls you. However, when we look at what uh, Hindus really believe, uh, we see that many of them actually don't agree with this kind of views. And this was uh, one guy who absolutely did not agree with this, uh, with this kind of views. This is uh, Mahmagami, uh, I guess you know him. Um, and he, and in his life, he wrote a lot of uh, he wrote a lot of letters. So people used to write him letters asking him advice about uh, situations, about experiences, about situations that they had in their life, and they asked him to reflect upon that and give them advice. And one day there was uh, a brother of uh, a brother of um, a woman who was uh, in severe pain. So severe pain and suffering. And he wrote to Gandhi that um, her sister had been contemplated suicide, but then she had reasoned against it because she had said, well, if I'm going to, to purify, if I'm going to kill myself, then I will no longer have the opportunity to actually purify the power of God. And Mahatma Gandhi said, well, actually, no, this is not, this is not right. He said, this is not how uh, God works. Because here he said, the question of God does not arise at all. If we were to bring in the law of karma in such matters, we would put an end to all effort. The working of karma is an incessant effort way process, whereas you and your sister evidently assume that certain actions are should motion, and that the motion in that straight direction continued uninterrupted without the operation of any further actions coming into play. The fact that it is that every activity in nature is constantly interfering with the law of karma. Such interference is inherent in the law, for the law is not a dead, rigid inner thing, but is an ever living, ever growing mind. So basically, what he, he what, what Mahatma Gandhi says here is indeed, uh, karma is important and we need to think about it, but in the end, we also don't know how it really works. And what is a is, is your illness a consequence of bad deeds? And will your illness and suffering that comes? comes with it, will that somehow purify these deeds? Atmagan says, in the end, we don't know. So you should not base conclusions on that, uh, on that principle of power. 
So he said, be careful with how you deal with, uh, with that idea of uh, God. And we see some kind of similar ambiguity in, um, in the responses of physicians and nurses to the question whether or not uh, euthanasia will actually lead to, uh, to bad karma. Because some said indeed it's going to lead to, uh, to bad karma because it's murder. But others said, no, it's not going to lead to bad karma because the intention is to do good. So basically, you're trying to, uh, to relieve suffering. So this is what one uh, physician said. He said that it's not bad karma because we're relieving so much pain while knowing that he has only a little bit of time left and the pain will not go away and that the patient also wants it. There's nothing wrong. So again, you see this uh, ambiguity here. Um, you're administering euthanasia for the benefit of the patient and it's rounded. That's why I don't think that the results for you be bad. Um, so most of these uh, physicians and nurses that I spoke to in India in the context of my research, they were actually not in favor of uh, euthanasia and assisted suicide. Um, but a few of them were. And the arguments in favor were putting an end to suffering. So because according to me, pain is such a thing that can be very difficult to deal with. I mean, only the one who is going through the pain can understand it. So if it's not treatable for the patient's wishes, so then I think we should give it to him. Others said, well, we can also save scarce resources. And that's, of course, a difficult thing to understand from resource-rich settings, such as the United States. But in India, you have to be aware that um, Healthcare can be extremely costly and, and can really bankrupt not just the current generation, but even future generations. So some people wondered, well, is this not something that we should consider? So this is what one doctor said. So according to my opinion, it would be better to administer euthanasia to these patients rather than waste other resources on them. So I'm not saying that it's a good uh, ethical perspective, but that's one thing there. Um, However, most of the participants, most of the people I spoke uh, to, really they were against. It. So most of them, of course, it's, it's illegal in India because well, the law does not allow it. But there were also uh, people who said, well, it's actually killing and no one should kill. It is not our right to take a life. It's not good on the part of the, of the doctor to kill. We're doctors, we're there to give life, not to take it. So these patients said, well, it's killing and doctors uh, should not kill. What should doctors do then? Well, as per these palliative care physicians and nurses, uh, doctors should provide good care to people. And they said, and they argued that if doctors provide good care, the pain, patients will actually not go on asking for um, euthanasia and assisted suicide. So, for instance, first what you said, and I'm sure it's only because of the pain that he doesn't want to live anymore. And another one said, see, many of our patients ask for mercy killing. Doctor, please give me some medicine. I'm in severe pain. Now, there's no aim of my life. But most of the time, I found that if you analyze what is making them to say that this resolves the problem 50% of the time. So, so this, this doctor, whenever you have this request for euthanasia and assisted suicide, you actually should um, really explore the causes. What is causing the suffering? What is causing the pain? What is causing the emotional stress? And you should try to address that. But the most important reason that I came, came across, and that's where we go back to our point of, uh, of religion, is of course this one, faith in a life-giving God. So these people, these physicians and nurses, they did not really talk a lot about, uh, about karma, but they did talk about a life-giving God. And there were, I spoke to Christian nurses in India and uh, Hindu physicians, uh, in, in the nurses, um, and they all said almost exactly the same thing. God gives life. Because of that, God can also take it. We cannot take life. No one except God has the right to take away one's life. Human beings do not have the right to take life which has been given by God. Um, so these were uh, people who had a very strong belief in a, in a personal God. In a personal God who cares for, uh, for people. Now, um, when we um, compare the, uh, the two groups um, with different kind of beliefs in it, we can also see actually how that influence attitudes towards uh, Indonesia because um, this, well, the colors are a little bit uh, difficult to distinguish here. Uh, 
um, because they're all red. Um, but um, yes, so one is this one is a little, little bit darker. Um, so when we see when uh, when we compare the ones who approve uh, voluntary euthanasia, we see that uh, those who believe in a um, um, approves voluntary euthanasia. Yes, um, we see that only very few in this uh, in this category have actually believed in a personal form. So more, um, sorry, um, most of the people who believe in a personal form of uh, ultimate reality actually. Um, it's uh, confused with the uh, with the colors. Um, So the point um, of the of the of the graph is, if you we had uh, we had uh, two groups of uh, of people here. So we had a certain um, Hindus who had a belief in a in a personal god who um, gives life and who is there to protect us. And what we can see here in this graph is that most of these people who had that belief in, uh, in this personal God, they ex ex exactly uh, disapproved of uh, voluntary euthanasia. But those who had vague or abstract notions of, uh, of ultimate reality, there it was different. Because these people, they did not have a strong belief in a personal God who really cares for people. So there were less, there were more likely actually to, uh, to approve voluntary euthanasia. Now, this uh, picture illustrates somewhat uh, that belief, because what you have here is um, a picture of the Hindu goddess uh, Durga. And uh, Durga is also seen, uh, seen as a model. Now, what you see on this picture is, well, you see many things here, but you, you see all, this, uh, all these weapons that she has here in this picture. Now, she has a very sweet face, but she can also be very fierce. And these weapons, she is going to use them to uh, to kill evil. So whenever you threaten any one of her devotees, that's at least the belief that she is going to use these uh, these weapons in order to kill them. Now, at the same time, this god is also um, a very loving god, and she, that is what this uh, um, hand here means. It's the you know, bio and a bio means do not be afraid. It doesn't mean stop. It means to not be afraid. You cannot, uh, I mean, you can't come to me. Um, so if you are in need, if you are faithful to me, I will come and, uh, and rescue you. So this is that, um, this is that belief that uh, many Hindus have, that if you're faithful to God, God will ultimately come and rescue you because God wants you to live. God wants you to live long and, and happy and God will be there to protect you because God is very powerful. And that is actually also what is told in, uh, in the stories about uh, avatars. And I know um, avatars, it's, it's also a term that's used for uh, movies about uh, water. Um, but in the stories about avatars, have nothing to do with water. Well, sometimes they do. Uh, for instance, in this story, that is uh, the story of, uh, of the god of Krishna. And what, is, what he's doing here is he is holding up a mountain. And that's a story that long time ago, uh, the god Indra was uh, angry and he made, he made it to rain on earth. And he was going to inundate the village and all the villagers were going to drown. So they were very afraid. So they prayed to the god, uh, to, to the god Krishna. And Krishna is an, is an avatar or a form of the god, uh, of the god Vishnu. And as an avatar, uh, God actually helps his people. So God is there to support people. So what did God do? Uh, God, in the form of Krishna, lifted that mountain and the mountain and held it over the villagers. And as a consequence, they were uh, protected from the rain and they did not die and all of them survived. So the real meaning of these kind of stories, about Sturga, as well as this, is that um, if you believe in God, if um, you pray to God and if you're faithful, then God will actually be with you. God will support you. So they have these um, these uh, stories, um, and that's of course also what patients find very important um, in Christianity. They also have a belief that God will be there to support you, but also in Hinduism, they have a strong belief 
that uh, God will be there to support you whenever you need him. And the patients also pray to God to, for that relief, for assistance from God. And studies all over the world, in, in a sense, have indeed also shown that religion and spirituality um, are important in that experience of illness and, uh, and disease. So we have already seen that um, religion is important for the attitudes of healthcare professionals, because of course it's also important for patients and their family members. Um, so patients, uh, religion and spirituality were really going to shape that experience and patients pray to God uh, to be rescued. And in that sense, we often see religion and spirituality as, as a source of support. And indeed, many people derive support from, uh, from their religion. But unfortunately, it's not always support, especially within the context of end uh, life care. And that's also something that our research in India has actually shown. This is um, the results of the result of, uh, of a study in which we um, assess levels of spiritual distress in a group of patients receiving palliative care in uh, in India. So these were all patients who were um, having some kind of severe uh, pain issues, other symptom issues that needed to be controlled. So we divided. We were on the basis of uh, the questions that we are asked. We were able to divide these patients into three groups. The first group was a group of uh, trustful patients. And these were patients who really had that faith that God was with them and that God would, uh, would rescue them. You remember the stories that I just told, right? So these were patients that believed, uh, that believed that they had been good believers and that God would ultimately be there to save them and rescue them. On the other side of the, of the crowd, we have a very different group. And these are the spiritually distressed patients. These were also patients who once had been very faithful believers and had been praying to God, but they felt that God had no longer was no longer listening to them, that God had deserted them. And they were wondering, like, why is that? Why is God not listening? And many of these spiritually distressed patients were actually patients who were really angry because they had this belief that God is there to support them or that God should support them, but he's not doing that. He's not helping them. And then here, we're having a kind of intermediate group, we would say, patients clinging to divine support. These are uh, patients that um, are actually still having a belief that God is with them, that God is supporting them, but they're also having that sense that, well, I'm in pain and I'm having suffering, and if God wants to help me, it's about time. So it's either now or I mean, let it be. Um, so these were also people who actually need a lot of support. So when you look at this graph, you see that these levels of spiritual distress in this uh, in this patient population are actually quite substantial. This year is uh, 70%, so that's not one in five, but it's getting close to that. Um, also here, that's 36%. These are, this is also a group that uh, actually needs uh, spiritual care. So we see here a group of patients uh, with tremendous spiritual needs that are actually um, not being addressed. Um, of course, doesn't mean that religion is, uh, is bad, of course. We see that patients are trying to get uh, support from their religion and how they're turning to religion and need to make them feel better. For instance, uh, we see here that 90% of the patients also agree with the state of prayer or chanting makes me feel better. Also, 88.3% said, um, God is with me. And 87% said, I have a belief in God, which gives me strength. Um, on the other hand, we also see a lot of negative answers um, that, that are actually indicative of uh, spiritual distress. For instance, uh, this illness is my faith. It's like nothing can be done about it. Or I wonder why this illness has happened to me. That means that they don't really have good existential answers. Or this illness is unfair. 76% of the patients agree with it. Now, the um, tragic thing is, or the paradoxical thing is that many people, many patients have these feelings at the same time. They may be having the feeling that, well, this illness is unfair, and at the same time, they still have this feeling that God is with them. So there are a lot of conflicted feelings. Uh, patients are, are searching, um, and they don't really always find, find good answers. And that's also what, uh, what Gandhi said. In he said, well, well, we have these ideas on, uh, on, on current, um, but they're not fixed final answers. You have to search for answers. You have to try to find answers. 
um, and many patients actually struggle with these uh, disasters. And um, what I've seen often among the patients that we have uh, that we have worked with is indeed that uh, faith in a caring God can indeed be a source of strength and, and hope. And many people uh, have that faith. They have that faith that God will be there, that God will uh, will support them. But at the same time, they're also asking that question: Why am I not getting better? So they're searching for answers, and very often they're searching in religion, and they're not satisfied with what they find. And that means that we need to distress. And it doesn't need to be uh, very dramatic, of course. I mean, many patients are able to cope uh, in, a, in a decent way. And uh, this uh, example of this uh, 64 year old uh, lawyer, uh, Bubesh, give that as a final example. He was uh, dying with uh, cancer of the spine, uh, spine sorry. And um, he was very much aware of his diagnosis and, uh, and, and prognosis. Uh, now, he was also a very learned man, and he also liked to talk to me about philosophy because he knew that I had studied philosophy in Paranasi. So he liked to talk about uh, philosophy, about uh, also about Buddhism, various religions. And then he said, well, um, maybe actually I'm getting, I'm getting this illness because of my kind, because of maybe something that I had done wrong in a, in a previous life. So you would say like, okay, he has that, he has a theory, he has an answer. So that means he should simply accept his, uh, his illness. But it's not so easy um, because this is what one of the physicians told me about him. He keeps asking for treatment options, while in reality, that's palliative care, of course, but there were no curative treatment options anymore. So you see, he had these uh, philosophical answers, but at the same time, it was an answer that Maybe he could use to give meaning, but it was not a final answer. He kept on searching for alternatives for his treatment, as well as um, for answers that could give meaning uh, to his life. And this is uh, this is the final slide here. This is also a very spiritual place in, uh, in India. This is uh, sun coming up over the Ganges and the Varanas. And this is uh, a place well, where, uh, where I studied philosophy, but it's also a place where actually people come, come to die, final years of their life, or where people want to be cremated because they believe that this will lead to, um, to a better rebirth or even to liberation from this uh, cycle of that rebirth. So it's also a place that actually illustrates how people uh, try to give meaning to suffering and try to give uh, meaning to that, and how people are actually uh, searching for answers. And throughout history and throughout the different religions, people have come up with various answers. And some of these answers have helped them to give meaning. Some of these answers have also helped them to give, um, have inspired them to develop ethical arguments about why certain treatment decisions may or may not uh, be effective. Uh, I'm sorry, may not be ethically permissible, but always these answers are actually part of a search. And people very often express these answers very hesitatingly because they're, they're searching. And I think this is something that is very important that we uh, keep in mind when we're talking about religion and spirituality um, at the end of life, that we're happy to do whether we are uh, talking to physicians or nurses, or whether we're talking to patients, we're having to, we're dealing with people who are searching for answers and whose answers are uncertain. So when we want to provide them support, we should not offer them, well, we should not think that we have uh, final answers to them, but we should give them opportunities that will actually help them to further their search for uh, answers. So that's what uh, I have to say.
fitting in a car to make this happen. Question. Sure. Um, so within the, you, you rank age, uh, gender, religiosity as different factors in terms of opposition and rejection of the work for uh, and school uh, youth Asian. Was that like a particular word, age, gender, or regional? Uh, did that have kind of this sort of age? Yes, and that's the first question we have. The second one within the new Catholic and Protestant finds one particular set more for or against uh, euthanasia. And so, what was the breakdown within that practice that this is first material so on so forth, as opposed to that kind of 15 and so on? Yeah, so that's, that's, that's a very good uh, question. In fact, there on that slide, um the they were not listed in order of this is more influential or this is less influential with the, with the exception of this uh, this last category uh in the sense that um there is no consistency across studies to what extent each of these factors influence uh, attitudes and i will try to say that in my lecture uh, as well in the sense that for instance some studies they have uh, observe that um, older physicians are more likely to be against it, uh, against euthanasia than younger physicians. And then um, studies try to explain why that is, but that is not a consistent finding. And the same is true with um, um, uh, other, other things such as uh, specialty or, or gender. So there are differences, but they're not consistent across uh, studies. Studies are much more consistent uh, with the influence uh, of uh, of religion, although a lot also depends on uh, on how you study it. And one way in which this used to be studied was indeed by asking the, the people the question, uh, to which religion do you uh, do you belong? And then check the box and then we can check whether there are associations with your attitudes to euthanasia. And then um, you have indeed uh, studies that have found that there are certain denominations that are um, more inclined towards acceptance than than others. For instance, Anglicans were were said to be more open to it than uh, the other denominations. And for instance, Roman Catholics to be more uh, inclined to be against it. Um, but these kind of uh, findings are not um, are not very consistent uh, as well. And so there's no final word on that. And what we can also wonder is to what extent is actually help does actually help us to understand to what, um, if, you, if you just ask to what kind of domination people, people belong, then you don't really know what kind of beliefs they have, and it doesn't really explain what motivates them to, to have that answer. For instance, is it to the, are, are Catholics uh, against the Nazi because that's what the church says, or are they um, against uh, euthanasia because they firmly believe that life is given by God um, and that they should not uh, take a life. These are things that overlap, of course, with everything they're going to say. I'm going to try it without a mic because the acoustics are great in this room. Um, does a religious person tend to have a more full picture of self, but make end of life decisions with no less conflict? Um, than other populations, be they secular materialists, non-believers, about endurance, finances, finality of a decision. So I guess the, the question is, um, even though the religious person may tend to have a full, let, full picture of life and of self, but in the end, does, does that matter when we're making the decision with no, or any less conflict than you want to make a final decision? Yeah, so that's a, that's a very great question, and um, it's it's actually difficult. It's it's difficult to to give uh, to give a very general uh, answer to that question because um, all people respond uh, different to this very tremendous challenge of uh, of illness and, uh, and suffering. And you have people um, who have um, very strong beliefs and. They believe that that God's with them. They also believe that um, God will support them, and they're able to derive strength from uh, from that belief. On the other hand, there are also people who have had these beliefs throughout their life that God's with them and that God supports them. But then that illness is really going to be a challenge to them because then they're going to wonder where is God in the face of all this uh, suffering? And I've been so good to to God, 
uh, and now God is not uh, is, is not here. So you cannot, if the question is, can you predict on the basis of the fate that someone has had during his or her life, uh, whether or not um, the patient is going to spiritually struggle at the end of life, then the answer is no, because each individual's context is, uh, is so different. Uh, the challenges that each person faces are so different. So it's very difficult to give a categorical answer to that question. Thank you. Um, if we have any additional questions online, please post them in the chat or in the comments. Yeah, my writing is very good. The word spirituality is quite vague. Could you do without it? Oh, that's a that, that, that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, maybe I try to squeeze too many things into this uh, this lecture, but it's it's a very good um, it's a very good question. So so what is uh, spirituality? Um, what do you think yourself? Do you find spirituality? Do you find it an appropriate term, or do you think it's too vague to to work with? Well, I tend not to use the word because I it means whatever you think it means, and I just find it unhelpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I think I think it's a very important uh, I think it's a very important remark that you make, and I think also um, in um, in research, very often the term the term is used without. Uh, too much consideration about what it really could mean. And it is, it is also true, and, and, and uh, you also find that criticism in literature as well, that um, it's, sometimes, it's sometimes said that um, spirituality is such a general, it's such a broad term that it basically can be, uh, can be used for anything. Um, for instance, um, it's said that well, spirituality overlaps to a large extent with uh, with religion, but it's 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 more than that. People also say that um, everyone is uh, spiritual. Um, so it's said that if you have this kind of uh, broad ideas about spirituality, then it becomes a term that is uh, that is impractical. Um, at the same time, um, when I use uh, the word spirituality well i do that in part of course because it's a term that's commonly used in the in, in, the, in the literature so you have to uh, use words that are somewhat understandable by others uh, but then i'm referring to that broader search for for meaning so people ask themselves this kind of uh, existential questions why is this happening to me why am i why am i suffering so it's that kind of very more not very particular but more particular kind of uh, questions that i'm uh, that i'm referring to but um, I perfectly um, understand that uh, that may not be satisfying to everyone. And I do think that in the literature, there should be more thorough discussion about what the term spirituality actually really means and what are the limitations of that uh, of the term. Thank you. Uh, Jim, you so how is a family to decide if they have someone who is entering that stage where to go, whether it's a hospital or home health care provider, is a, is a very religious patient supposed to pick a place that's overtly religious in its title? And I guess you could say the same thing for somebody who's very non-religious. Do they have to avoid uh, centers that are uh, in, in affiliated with faith-based organizations? Um, you're talking about in the flight care in general, whether, whether you should go to uh, a healthcare organization that is affiliated with your uh, with your own religious beliefs or not? Yeah, do they have to do, they have to do that work, or is it, is it incumbent on the organization to find out about that person's religious background and try to accommodate? Well, um, a an organization that is going to that that in, it is that intends to provide. Uh, Good end of life care should be open to all religious uh, religious perspectives, right? Um, so they need to have uh, people on their staff who are uh, trained and who have experience with exploring these uh, these religious issues. So in that sense, if you have uh, people who are qualified within the uh, within the area of uh, spiritual care, these people should be able to provide 
um, care to, to a Jewish patient, to a Hindu patient, um, or to a Roman Catholic patient, or a Baptist, or, or whatever. Now, being able to provide good care, um, good spiritual care, also means that you should uh, be aware when it's need to call in someone to assist you. For instance, if, um, if the family clearly indicates that they would like someone from their own religion, you need to have access to these, uh, these resources. For instance, uh, if you have a Jewish patient and the patient or the family indicates that, that he or she wants a rabbi, you should see that you have access to these, uh, to these resources. Uh, I'm not sure whether that exactly answers the question. We do not have any questions online. Anybody have any additional questions in, in person? I guess I kind of want to follow up with that. So if the hospice worker is an atheist and, and they don't believe in any of those religions, how then do they become a person? So there, there are ways to, uh, first of all, you need to, uh, you need to come to know what actually is, uh, what actually is a problem. So it could, could, could be the case, for instance, that, um, that uh, the staff nurse uh, has, has, uh, has told you, like, hey, I think that that person has certain, has certain issues with his, uh, with his faith. So you have, to start, um, you have to start exploring the issues. So first you have to, to come to know, of course, uh, what exactly does that patient believe or what are the, the beliefs that, uh, that are giving, uh, that are challenging the patient. For instance, you could say, well, the patient, uh, this is a situation in which a patient always has been or has considered him or herself a uh, faithful devotee of God, and now suddenly that uh, illness is, is challenging that, uh, that belief. Now, so first you have to uh, ask about, uh, about this. What actually, what actually are your beliefs? What is actually important to you? Um, then you have to figure out, of course, how um, central are these, uh, are these beliefs? Uh, because if beliefs, if a patient holds certain beliefs, but they're not very important, well, of course, then they may also not have a very uh, strong impact on the on the experience of um, of that uh, that illness. So these are these are things that you can explore even if you're not part of that very same uh, same community. Um, of course, it's going to help if you have uh, if you have certain background knowledge of the of the beliefs of that uh, of that community. But sometimes um, knowledge can also be limiting in a certain way, in the sense, in the sense that knowledge can also lead to stereotype, and that's something that you have to be very careful with when you're providing spiritual care. In the sense that you're not going to um, resort to stereotypes. In the sense that all Hindus believe that their illness is a consequence of karma. For instance, um, so you should always be open to explore the particular beliefs because a patient may always have different beliefs than what you read in the, in the textbook. Now, you start with uh, with exploring these uh, these beliefs and how important they are, and then also you try to figure out what are the kind of support systems that the patient has um, available for him or herself. So, does the patient have actually some kind of Religious, or to say it with a bit of bigger term, some kind of spiritual network. Um, so that could be, for instance, is a, is a patient part of um, of a religious community, or uh, or a prayer group, or a, or a church, or or, or or a temple group, and is that group important to that patient? And would the patient want these people uh, to be involved? And that brings us then to the last uh, step. You need to explore uh, with the patient how do you want us to be. Uh, part of addressing these uh, these issues do you want us to help you to further talk to you about these, uh, these issues without of course think, uh, pretending that we have the answers to your question <laughs> or do you want us to contact someone who can further explore these uh, these issues with you and that could then be someone from the community of the of the religious community of the patient so that sounds like it would work well unless the patient asks the atheist hospice worker. Well, what do you think personally? What do you mean? I mean, I mean, if the hospice, if the hospice worker is an atheist and the patient is is religious, regardless mm -hmm. of religion, um, that would work fine because the the hospice worker is asking the patient, "Hey, what do you want me to do for you?" But if the patient started getting personal, 
and ask the hospice worker, hey, what do you think? Yeah. The hospice worker would not be allowed to say, well, sorry, but I'm an atheist. No, that, that, that's, that's, that's what you need not be, um, that would indeed not be the, uh, the right answer. And uh, that is indeed, that are indeed questions that, uh, that healthcare professionals, uh, that healthcare professionals themselves get. What do you, what, what do you think about, uh, about this issue? And do you think that my illness is, and that's like, I think the kind of question that you're, that you're getting at. Do you think that my illness is, uh, is a punishment uh, of God, uh, from God? What you need to ask is, I mean, you know that your answer is in fact to this question is, is it's, it's irrelevant. It's the search for meaning of this, this particular patient. So what you need to probe is, why are you actually asking that question? Um, if the patient insists, you could uh, you could say, well, maybe later I can I can share my perspective. But first, first I would I would like to know from you why are you asking this my 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 this question? And then the patient may open up, and the patient may say, well, in my since the moment I was young, people have been telling me that every every need has a consequence, and um, now I'm suffering this illness. Now. I find that very hard to believe because I was not such a bad, uh, bad person and I was suffering it. So then you're helping the patient to explore that uh, issue. So it's always about why are you asking that question and why do you need an answer and how is that answer going to help you? Uh, are the near death experiences from the different religions, are they distinctly different or is there? A uniform type of behavior in all the religions, uh, the near death experience. And, and to, to be honest, I'm not, I'm not a specialist in uh, in the near death uh, that experience, so I'm not not uh, absolutely sure about what uh, what the literature says about whether these experiences are uh, are similar. Um, we do have an online question, and then we have one more in the room. The online question is. You've been talking about how religion and spirituality affects the patients, but do you think that it could affect the family in the same way, or does the family have a stronger or weaker connection? In yeah, so that that's a very good question, and we will have to squeeze in everything in that in fifteen minutes. But maybe indeed I should have talked a little bit more um, about the uh, the experience of the uh, of, of the family. Now, um, of course. The family also has um, a certain religious uh, religious belief. Now, the, the problem the, the problem is that that the experience of the of the family it's um, their experience as a person with their own um, health history, which is maybe substantially different from uh, from what the patient actually has. So, to, to their perspective on religion, may be substantially be different. Um, what we what we do often uh, what we do often see is um, and in India I've seen that uh, I've seen that a lot is that the the family is actually trying to stimulate feelings what they uh, what they consider what they consider uh, positive coping um, so in the uh, in the Indian context this very concretely uh, creates situations in which the patient is uh, the patient is dying. But the family is continuously saying, "Well, you have to, you have to pray to God. Um, God is going to help you. And yes, you're not seeing it, but God is going to help you. Just go to that temple, do that prayer. And that's of course done with the bad intentions. Um, but it's not always helping because it can actually push the patient towards that anger towards God because the family is then saying, "Well, um, I have to pray to God, and I'm doing all that, and still God is not helping." So indeed, um, it's, it's very important that when uh, spiritual care is being provided to the, to the patient, that uh, the family becomes part of that, uh, of that whole discussion because they are indeed going to, be, to play a very important role in, in how the patient is going to spiritually and religiously respond to, this, uh, to these issues. Thank you. So, if you break down, End of line of care. So three categories: you have uh, fully privately funded, okay? then you have fully government funded, uh, whether it's for insurance or just you know state hospital or state hospital care, and then you have the hybrid. So private, you get federal or state funding. So let's go to categories two and three. On the one hand, uh, the old emphasis on religious uh, choice could be a separation of issue. On the other hand, the non 
could be a uh, sort of a discrimination issue on, 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 on based on very based on what's already on religion. So how do we jump supposed to do, and how do we make sure that on the, on the one hand somebody who's getting Medicare or Medicaid, uh, or so if it's fully private, I understand. You know, there's the, the dilemma is almost not because you get what you want. But if you have a hybrid of the state or the federal government, the state that was paid for, um, on the one hand, again, there's that separation clause, on the other hand, it's the freedom of religion you know, issue, and they're both guaranteed the same amendments. So, how do we judge those two? Yeah, well, um, it's it's interesting, uh, or it's relevant within the context of that question to uh, to go back to the to the slide that I showed about uh, at, the, at the very beginning with uh, with Cicely Saunders, and and she says, well, one of the things I actually want to do is I want patients to to come to know the Lord, and for her that was not like simply like God in general. That was her Anglican faith. That is what she wanted to, to know the, the people about. Now, Cicely Saunders also went through uh, through some evolution. Um, and she met patients from all shades of uh, shades of life. So she also changed her perspective. Of course, she still had these uh, these Christian beliefs, but she also realized that it was not necessarily about uh, converting people to uh, to Christianity. So when we are um, talking about uh, providing spiritual care to patients, we're not uh, talking about um, getting people into your, into your own religious fault. We are just like what palliative care is doing. Palliative care is, is, is dealing with pain and symptoms and spiritual distress is actually a symptom of the illness that needs to be treated. And it's very important that it is treated because it can really lead to a lot of distress if it's not properly uh, treated. And that distress is going to have an impact on um, the uh, experience of pain, but also how effective your pain management is going to be, also in the area of uh, physical pain. So that is that is why it's so important that, that all organizations, whether they're government, private funding, whatever source uh, they have, that is why it's so important that they also pay attention to that complement of spiritual care. Can you join me in thanking our speaker one more time? Good afternoon here. Um, so this is just to thank all of you for coming tonight. And here, here, here in the room as well as uh, online, really appreciate taking the time, listening to a topic, especially young people. This isn't a real attractive uh, topic to them, but it's something that affects every single one of us now and later. Um, I would uh, also be remiss if I did not mention that it takes the village to present great content to you. I would like to thank Dr. Aramash, uh, Dr. Carden, and Associate Provost Dr. Fisher, uh, Amanda, Lisa, and Crystal Furia from the advancement team of Penn West, uh, Bradley Peters supporting all of our AV needs, uh, our Highland ambassadors, and our honor students. Thank you for your support of tonight's event. Most importantly, thanks to the audience again and the healthcare providers who we really were hoping this will reach, and hospice providers who uh, are in attendance. Those are real heroes that don't get a lot of attention. And, any, all you have to do is read an obituary and you will see the appreciation that families have for those hospice providers. It's a very difficult and very um, uh, meaningful uh, position. Um, thank you for the work that you do to bring comfort and care at the most critical times in our lives.